Good morning and welcome to the September 11th, 2023 uh, Special Populations Committee meeting. Good morning to everybody and um, we're really excited to get started discussing our topics today. Um, I think it's going to be a great discussion. When we talk about programming for our highly able students, we most often are talking about elementary and middle school options. However, we know we challenge and prepare our highly able students in high school uh, how we challenge and enable them in high school really has a huge effect on everything that they do going forward in the future. Um, today we're going to dig into a wide range of options and the high school level um, and what those options say about our philosophy of gifted education at the, and um, what are successes and opportunities with our current programming. Before I go on, I want to give my colleagues a moment to introduce themselves. Start with uh, Ms. Harris. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lynn Harris. I use she, her pronouns. And I do want to note that we have some guests with us today. Um, we have uh, students from Rockville High School who are part of the Rockville Register team, the journalism partnership between the seven schools, Rockville and RM High Schools, and uh, uh, Richard, Mc uh, I'm sorry, Julius West, Frost, and Earlwood Middle School. Am I missing two schools? Or is it just five? <laughs> hey. Anyway, the students have a, a, a plan to cover all Board of Education meetings this year. Wow. And so this is, they're kicking it off today. So I said, Very impressive. well, <laughs> yeah. yay. Anyway, welcome. It's a good one to be here for. So welcome. Ms. Yang. Good morning, everyone. Julie Yang, District 3. Glad to be here. Good to see everyone. Happy Monday. And I guess I'm Rebecca Smontrowski. <laughs> district, I represent District 2 and the chair of the committee. Um, before we start, uh, if want, staff wants to introduce themselves as well, we'll start with Ms. Webb. Good morning, everybody. Lori Christina Webb. I have the honor of being the chief of staff for the board. Good morning. Juan Ramos, administrative services manager for the board. Good morning, everyone. Irina Lagrange, Director of College and Career Readiness and District-wide Programs. Good morning, Peggy Pugh, Chief Academic Officer. Good morning, Jeannie Franklin, Director of the Division of Consortia Choice and Application Program Services. Good morning, Jennifer Scavoldo, Coordinator in the Office of Accelerated and Enriched Instruction. Great. So next I will ask my colleagues if they have any questions, concerns, or thoughts on the uh, May 15th meeting informational summary. No? All right, then we're going to keep moving. We're looking forward to a lively conversation. This is a critical topic for MCPS, how we understand rigorous instruction, who gets access to it, and how we ensure that the options, um, or that there are options for all of our students. Um, if you would like to go ahead, we can get started. Sure, thank you. Next slide, please. <laughs> this morning, we would like to share with you an outline of our discussion so that you're aware of what is coming forth. So first, we thought it was important to do some framing and some key messaging out there to make sure that we're all on the same page with what we do offer and what we have available to our students. Um, the school system's work is laser focused on making sure that we have opportunities at the high school level to prepare our students to be college, career, and community ready. Well, we will also be walking you through how we prepare our students a little bit of a summary between elementary and middle so that you know that it's not just getting to high school and having access to enriched programs, but it really is talent development all along. We would also like to be able to share with you the services in high school with some data snapshots around the work where we're making some gains and that the district has a lot to be proud of and also highlighting where we need to grow. Um, and then we will have a discussion uh, around some of those data. It's important to note, too, that when we're talking about enriched and accelerated opportunities, that we are also inclusive of our special education students. We do have students who receive services who are also able to participate in many of the opportunities that we have at the high school level. So this is not an exclusive pathway. This is a pathway that's available for all. Next slide, please. So in line with the board's strategic plan around academic excellence, one of the, the key indicators has been increasing access to these enriched and accelerated opportunities for our underrepresented student groups. 
we approach this work with an integrated fro focus, b building in and adding some of the work from our anti-racist audit, where there were very specific recommendations, both in uh, domain six under equity of access, where it was really looking at the enrollment criteria for accelerated programs to make sure that that wasn't leading to disproportionality in the um, racial and uh, subgroup participation, and that we make sure that our screening and our processes do find students who had have the potential to be successful in the higher level courses. Secondly, the observation 6.4, members of the community didn't perceive that there were equitable opportunities. So we have some work to do there, really to make sure that our community is aware of what the opportunities are and that our students are prepared to be successful in those courses. Next slide, please. Some of what drives our work for excellence in this area uh, are the following key messages regarding enriched and accelerated um, um, programming. It's important to note that we believe that every child has talents that can be nurtured in a variety of ways. Okay. There are many, many different opportunities for students here in Montgomery County Public Schools, and for that we should be proud. We also believe that there are opportunities to meet students' enrichment needs in their home school. Every school has programming that's available for them that can meet their unique needs and their special interests. Third, our high school students have access to enriched and accelerated programs both in their local program, they also have them in regional programs, and then virtual um, opportunities. And also to make sure that it's not a one and done. It's not by the time you reach third grade, if you don't hit this level, that you can never get into programs. There are numerous on and off ramps all the way up for students to be able to help them continue to stretch themselves and continue to explore areas of interest and areas of talent. And then finally, our commitment to talent development does include the enrichment programs, making sure that our teachers have professional development about what it means to plan for students, making sure that we have enriched um, and accelerated uh, curricula, both options to meet the needs of our students. And uniquely, we have dedicated staff in every school to be able to help drive these programs and meet the needs of our students. Next slide, please. So this graphic may be familiar with you. It's been a steady illust illustration of the work that's done from K to 12 over the past few years. For most of you, this is familiar as it shows the projection of serving our students entering K to successfully completing programs through as a senior. It's designed to show that on the left, the system internal checks is what, what MCPS will do, and on the right, it's the various on-ramps that I spoke of that are available for students all the way through uh, their experience here in, in school. We do understand that students blossom at different times for their different interests and their different needs. And so for that reason, there are a variety of programs at the high school. These programs are designed to both satisfy curiosity, nurture our students' interests, and continue to strengthen their skills so that they're pre prepared for their next steps beyond Montgomery County Public Schools. We want to prevent, present a full story of the work that we do from K-12. So let's begin with elementary, and I'll pass this to Ms. Scavullo. Next slide, please. Okay, so in elementary school, we'll talk about math and literacy enrichment and acceleration. Um, math enrichment is available in all of our schools um, in K-5. through five. It's built into the Eureka curriculum. For, uh, for our teachers and students. Enriching the learning using the Eureka Math is structured, systematic, tiered approach, and is implemented as students demonstrate a need for greater rigor and complexity. Learning is deepened within the grade level standard. Students who consistently receive enrichment in math may be considered for advanced math options in grade four, which would be math four five, and then grade five for math five six. Literacy, um, we have primary talent development is offered for uh, kindergarten through second grade in 39 of our Title I schools. The purpose of this program is to provide, provide enrichment opportunities through science in order to develop learning behaviors such as creativity, leadership, perseverance, and problem solving. The enriched literacy curriculum is now in all of our elementary schools this year, with the exception of our two-way immersion and special centers. So it's very exciting for us. Mm -hmm. This opportunity is offered in reading language arts and uses resources from junior great books, William and Mary, and the units of study and writing. 
and then Atlanta, well, I think I have one more, Centers for Nurse Studies. The Centers for Nurse Studies is a criteria-based program in 13 elementary schools for grades four and five. This program cohorts students in reading, writing, social studies, and science, and provides opportunities for students to engage in complex text, develop critical and creative thinking skills, and complete inquiry-based projects across various subjects. Benchmark Advance with enrichment is also available in all schools for grades K through five and provides enrichment opportunities very similar to those found in the Enriched Literacy cur Curriculum. And then last, we have our language immersion, one-way and two-way immersions in fr Chinese, French, and Spanish is available, is available in some of our elementary schools. Okay. All right, next, I think, am, am I the next, mm -hmm. next slide. Mm -hmm. So enriched, um, enriched courses in high school credit courses in middle school. All middle schools offer enriched and accelerated courses where students can earn high school credits. Some enriched courses, um, such as the Applied Investigations into Mathematics 6, mm -hmm. as well as the Global Humanities for grades 6 and 7, um, are available to all students in all schools. Illustrative Math also has two accelerated courses, AMP 6 Plus and AMP 7 Plus. Students that are, that are on an advanced math pace can also take Honors Algebra 1, Honors Geometry, Honors Algebra 2 are options in middle schools. We also have um, World Languages, Computer Science, and Fine Arts courses are available to students. Can I just ask a quick question to clarify? And it's kind of been swirling around in my mind and I'm trying to figure out the right way and time, the appropriate time to ask this, but Give me what your definition, I guess, of um, enriched um, education is. I mean, is, is, are we basically saying if you're not accelerated, if you're on grade level, mm -hmm. that's not an enriched um, curriculum? Do you want me? Again, I'm, I appreciate that I'm not sure I'm asking it in the right way. I just, it's, Going, you know, we're we're talking about advanced courses, which I appreciate, but isn't all of our curriculum an enriched curriculum? So can I maybe make it just an example? So our aim, our applied investigative mathematics six course, is enriched and accelerated. So students get to go deeper with the grade level standards, and they're also more they they go at a faster pace. Whereas our AMP six plus isn't. If I hope I say this right, because mm -hmm. it I think it is just accelerated, and the AMP 7 is like just accelerated. So the AIM is an example of going deeper with the standards and faster. Okay, and you get additional credits or, or, or? For those courses, no. The high school credit comes with algebra, geometry, and algebra 2, um, and then with um, high school computer science or intro to engineering um, courses, That's or world and world languages as well. So what I would add to that is grade level courses are um, highly challenging courses. The grade level work and the grade level standards according to the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards is uh, challenging work. And it's our goal to make sure that every student has access to that grade level standard. And, that's, and, and if students can have that level of access to the grade level standards, they can then be successful in subsequent courses. So that's what allows us to then build on ramps. These other examples are examples of going deeper into a content, going deeper into uh, subjects because, because you don't have to build in any kind of scaffolding or reteaching. The, so the list on the left is the ones with, that come with high school credit that are truly accelerated. The enriched courses is a deeper study that's gonna allow students to explore critical thinking and try project-based learning and participate in a lot of um, really focused activities. And then the accelerated courses is moves faster. I mean, it, it is grade level and faster, if that helps. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, just a couple questions right here on this slide. Um, could you give a little bit of an explanation of how the Applied Investigations into Mathematics course differs from straight up Algebra Geometry, Algebra 1, Algebra 2 Geometry? It sounds like you were talking about, I don't know, how does that, how does that differ? 
We have we have a substitute with us today who's been willing to join us. Um, Nikki, do you want to speak to it? Um, and so um, while that transition is happening, just a uh, question. So when we look at the high school credit courses column, so we have 40 middle schools. Are world languages available in every one of our 40 middle schools? Yes, it's just not all languages are available at all schools. Okay. And so as we look at this list of high school credit courses that a student could choose in middle school, every one of those is available in every one of our 40 middle schools. So, so I would say Spanish and French are available in, in, if not all, almost all of our middle schools. Chinese would be the one that's not in all of our middle schools. Um, for for the, the math courses, it depends on the trajectory of the students in the school. If they have students that, and they have enough for a class to offer Algebra 2, then yeah, that, that will be offered at the school. Most schools at least go to Algebra 1, and many of our, our middle schools, if not close to all of them, offer um, at least one, one a section of geometry, in, in, my, in my experience of working with middle schools. Mm -hmm. For computer science, um, the high school credit for computer science is a widely offered course. The intro to engineering is offered mostly in the schools that also feed into a high school that has Project Lead the Way, and, and we'll talk about Project Lead the Way later. Um, so not every middle school will have the intro to engineering class. Um, and I can start the, the answer to the math question. So applied investigations, and in, in, so my background is not mathematics. This is just from working with all the middle schools. Um, it starts with, because they come in having already had math five, six, so it's starting farther into the standard six um, standards and then moves through the math seven standards. So they, they should be done with most of math seven by the time they finish sixth grade. So that way they're moving at a faster pace to get ready for um, the seventh grade, which has changed since I've been in middle school. Um, and now, not when I was a student, but when I was working in the schools. Um, and so that they can at least get to algebra one by eighth grade. Ms. Hazel, you wanted to? Yeah. And is the applied investigations into math, is that available in all 40 middle schools? Yes, it's, a, it's available in all of our middle schools, and this was our attempt to make sure that we have multiple on-ramps mm -hmm. for our students. So we, you know, we have um, received a lot of feedback from our communities around um, tracking, and we wanted to make sure that we gave students who needed to, to be enriched but maybe not go as fast as an accelerated course um, to have that opportunity, but other students who may be ready for more acceleration. But with the goal um, of giving students that opportunity to be in algebra by grade eight, if that was the goal. I think that actually touches a lot on what I was trying to get at before as well. And if you could further uh, discuss just briefly, but um, the on right when you all refer to on ramps, you've had you've mentioned this over the years and um, just for our audience and viewing. Yes, but well, because at the elementary level, we start uh, looking at students at the end of grade three mm -hmm. for whether or not they will be um, in accelerated courses, what we used to call compacted math or right. four, five, and five, six math. And um, there was a, a really strong feeling that that was the only time a student could be selected to be in an accelerated course. So either you get in at the end of grade three or you never. So this was really our opportunity to provide um, access for students building other courses that would allow them that enrichment to go in a little deeper, a little faster. Um, so, you know, if you had a visual, there could be different pathways that you could get to algebra by grade eight um, or, or grade seven. It just depends. So, you know, we still say seven, eight, or nine. Um, depending on when the student is really demonstrating that readiness, but we want to provide multiple pathways to get there. And one last question about the implied investigations course. Is that, I'm, I'm trying to think back, uh, when my son was at Einstein, he was in the IB program, 
And it seems like, does the applied investigations into math, would that be one that sort of feeds into the type of math courses that are embedded in the IB programs? Because it seems to me that the title of his math courses included applications or, I mean, something like that. It wasn't, stri it wasn't just, you know, pre-calc or something. It was, it was a much more applied, focused math, it seemed like. That's a great question. And the intention of the applied, one of the intentions of the applied investigations in mathematics was it's supposed, it was designed thinking about our existing magnet programs already. So looking at the math, science, computer science uh, programming, we were looking at designing a math uh, course that would align with the pace and the rigor of that course. So the idea was just to strengthen students' logistical, mathematical skills so that they had numerous opportunities going throughout. Um, particularly in high school. So it wasn't designed to go into any one track. It was just designed to strengthen math, um, mathematic, math, mathematic skills and to prepare students for rigor going into high school. But I did want to just close out on the one high school credit course on science and fine arts. We did list it there, um, but the Middle School Magnet Consortium at Argyle, Parkland, Leuterman, they offer high school credit courses in science and fine arts. So that's not countywide, but we just but those are unique courses that you can get at those three schools in the science and arts for high school credit. Thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. <coughs> and I'm... Very, I have a special place in my heart for our middle school students, so I appreciate the opportunity that they will have multiple uh, opportunities, right, to get to Algebra 1 by 8th grade. Now, my questions about those high school credit courses are about uh, GPA impact for high schools. So if a students take these high school credit courses in middle school, do those grades impact their graduation GPA um, in high school? Yes, uh, it, they are high school courses, and that's something that we really stress with our parents to understand that when they are taking those courses, um, they are um, counting towards graduation. If they don't do well, they can, re can they retake the class, though, and get the better grade? Yes, they can. They can um, retake the course, um, and we also have, I know for world languages, um, the, there's actually a system that our Office of Technology um, has where it will bump out um, the lower grade for, for world languages and keep the higher grade for students who start in middle school and, and go to high school. I think that that is... Um important for family uh, to understand that so that it would not be a surprise. So all these will also appear on their high school transcript as part of it. Thank you. Any more questions? I think we're good so far. Okay, next slide please. Okay, so we do have regional services available to our middle schools. Um, we do have the regional criteria-based programs, humanities and communication at Eastern and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Middle Schools, and our math science, computer science offered at Roberto Clemente and Tacoma Park Middle Schools. Then we do have our three middle school magnet consortiums, Argyle um, with the digital design and development, Loiterman with the creative and performing arts, and Parkland with the aerospace technology and robotic engineering. So these are, um, and these three schools are whole school um, magnets and are part of the choice process. And then we have a number of middle schools that offer the language immersion experience. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you so much. So as we look at the K through 12 trajectory and we think about the middle school to high school transition, we really wanted to be intentional in empowering middle school students in understanding the application process and having a clear understanding of what, of what their opportunities are both at their local high schools and from the regional and countywide perspective. So we received feedback from students, we received parents from feedback and from board members as well about how over 
overwhelming the application process is for high schools. Uh, we know we have nights where we've done videos, we have packets, we have booklets, uh, we visit very, uh, various middle schools and we speak to students and families and it's still overwhelming. So one thing that we decided to do last year was to create our first um, CTE Career Technical Education Exploration Day. And we were very strategic in designing it for seventh graders. And we did that because we, we wanted our seventh graders to be exposed to this information prior to eighth grade application process. And then we also did it asynchronously. And in doing it in asynchronously, we uploaded it through Canvas, which means that students and families now have access to it at any point. So this fall, as our current eighth graders begin the application process, they can go back into Canvas and have all of the information available to them. Also, one thing that we did in terms of uh, presenting all of our 11 pathways, we interviewed current MCPS students because we felt that uh, sometimes middle school students uh, listen more to um, high school students than they do to adults. And, um, and so we received great feedback on that as well. What's also important is that we had over 30 middle school who participated this last spring in this event. Um, and we had over um, 3,800 students who took the survey and 70% of them indicated that they are actually interested in a CTE pathway and they wanted to learn more about it. We shared those results with all of the high school resource counselors last spring, and that way high school counselors can see students that are coming their way. They can have an understanding with, of what students are actually interested in. And this is really important because as we think about single courses that we offer at the high school level, if we, if we think about different pathways, I think it's important to have that current data and for us to have it a year in advance where we can really evaluate the programs that are available to us, do some marketing, and make sure that we're receiving students and offering them the programs and courses that they're interested in. Um, the other thing that we also um, liked about this opportunity for our students is um, if we think about, for example, our students who receive special education services, our multilingual students, students who receive special education services in eighth grade, they have their transition meeting. And so we thought by having this as a canvas, parents have access to this as well. When they have those meetings, they can again discuss different pathways and opportunities for students. Um, we also wanted to, um, our next step in, th in terms of growth and what we want to do differently in collaboration with Career Advising and the Blueprint, uh, we are planning to meet with a counseling team, the Career Advising team and the CTE team to think about what additional opportunities can we create this year for all of our sixth graders. So in thinking about career exploration, and again, when we say career exploration, we have 51 specific programs, but in addition to that, we have uh, AP Opportunity International baccalaureate, we have regional programs, and again, the focus always being on what does your local high school offer. So getting students excited and have, making sure that families know while you have opportunities for other programs, this is what's offered at your high school. And if you are interested, for example, in, uh, in becoming an artist, here are the courses that you might want to take. So really being creative in that. So we are going to be meeting uh, collaboratively with counseling, career advising, to think of another event that we can have for all of our sixth graders, because we really want to make sure sure that we start sooner. So again, going back, mapping into sixth grade and fifth grade and really building student capacity so that when they get to high school, they know what well, these are my options and this is what I can apply for. Next slide, please. Quick question. Yes, of course. We have how many middle schools? I we have 32. 40. Oh, 40? 40. 42. 40. So why did not all of our schools participate? It was the first time we were doing this program, and what's also nice is the word got out that students appreciated this and having this information. So some of the middle schools are planning to make it available to students. Students can do this independently, and we designed it that way too so that we're not burdening teachers and having to study um, the information to present to students. And what's also nice, all of the middle school have the academic morning academic period so that schools can offer this information during that morning academic period. So that's something we're planning to go back to the schools and making sure that all the students are able to look at it this fall and they can do it again during the morning academic period and then they have access to it in their canvas. So all of our middle school students have this information sitting in their canvas course currently. But only if they participated in the program, right? No, no, we uploaded it intentionally. So by participating, they could see the videos, but they could watch it on their own as many times as they want because it was done asynchronously. If, as, just as a follow-up, if we could get a list of the schools that did not participate, that would be great. Okay. Um, Ms. Harris. Yes. Yeah. Um, if we could Previous go back slide, to slide nine. Uh -huh. Just had a 
question. And um, looking at that slide, so I, I clearly it's it's cut off there a bit, so we're not seeing all of the um, program that mm -hmm. students yes. could indicate interest in. Mm -hmm. um, so as you're moving forward now, and you, uh, you're, all of this is available on Canvas, so any student and family can look at it at any point mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. Is does the the Canvas option does it also contain the data collection tool at the end where students can indicate interest in this Survey. program, that program, There's and are we collecting that kind of in mm -hmm. real time? We are. So we're com the data survey is available to students. We actually created this platform ourselves. So Mr. Dunstan and my, on my team created this platform, which then not only allows counselors to look at where they're interested, but also supervisors in my department can see this is where the energy is. This is what kids are really excited about. We have some programs that we know we have to grow because they're really small. Other programs we have have a waiting list. So really think about like where is the interest right now? We make a lot of assumptions mm -hmm. and here having data from close to 4,000 students saying this is what we're interested in, mm -hmm. we're able to look at it and then also think about for example, a high school might not have the entire pathway available to them, but they can think about offering a course, right? We, I, in a few minutes I'll speak to dual enrollment. So with dual enrollment right now we have over 475 courses. So now another thing we're exploring and thinking about, are there going to be opportunities for example, for students to take a course at Montgomery College at no cost and then learn the material, uh, learn the content that might not be available at their current high school. Will there be opportunities, for example, down the roads for students to take courses at Montgomery College and perhaps earn their industry recognized credentials, which is also part of the blueprint. So this is all that we're exploring and thinking about. We want to build our high schools, we want to build our programs, but we also want to build this access to Montgomery College mm -hmm. and think about what, what can we have there that we don't have to then go back and make sure that each high school has if all of our students have access to courses at Montgomery College mm -hmm. at no cost and they, are, they get the exposure and the content, that's also another opportunity for some of the on-ramping. So if um, the, so we're using this data, I'm assuming, to both promote specific knowledge about dual enrollment opportunities, these courses are available to you at Montgomery College for free. But are we also using the data that we're collecting to decide ab about program expansion? Yeah. I mean, there are many programs that we all know are just, they are not right. equitably available. <laughs> Big, long waiting list. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, global ecology, one school, one, mm -hmm. one high school out of 25, mm -hmm. all the way up mm -hmm. in the corner of the county. Yeah. So we're looking at this to help us decide where to expand like Teacher Academy of Maryland. Exactly. And that, and the uh, last question I have is, this is just a question, an idea, a thought. Mm -hmm. So it, through our sustainability policy, we've also pledged to making students both aware of and exposed to 21st century green careers. Mm -hmm. Is there a way in this tool that you've developed to sort of flag with a symbol some of those courses that really and truly are sort of sustainability focused, environmental science focused, 21st century green careers like CASE to maybe build the buzz around poor CASE, which is still struggling, but is an amazing opportunity. Um, the horticulture track that students can get that industry certification, mm -hmm. but a lot of students don't know about it. Is there a way that we can Put a little leaf on those. I, 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 leaf um, symbolically, yes. I, I love that idea, and that's a great recommendation. And I also think what this opportunity does, and let's, if we can speak to Case for a second. Mm -hmm. For example, we just had, um, we were exchanging um, um, emails and, and communication with Northwood High School, and they're thinking of some really creative ideas around Case, and I commend them for that, yeah. right? So I think that's another opportunity, I think, is as high school principals, there's an opportunity to market, to get excited, and then to think about you might not have the entire pathway, but can you engage kids through opportunities through field trips? Can you engage students through other resources that are available in MCPS in this district? Can you engage students through free courses at Montgomery College, which wasn't available a year ago? So I do think there's a, there's a way really to think about um, 
MCPS, especially when it comes to sustainability, Chesapeake Bay, and our environment. And I think it just comes down to marketing and being really creative. And so one thing that's also been helpful this year is that we have two apprentices who are high school students who are fabulous. And so asking them for their point of view to share with us how they're seeing the marketing that we're doing. Is it interesting? Is it engaging? And I love that we have students here to really, because sometimes I think we think that we know what students, high school students like, but we don't. And so having that student voice data and, and having our apprentices help us with some of that marketing is going to be critical. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I also have a question on this slide. So Mrs. Lagrange, my colleagues has asked some macro questions. Mm -hmm. I want to really drill down to the individual school and individual student level with this data. So tell me what happened. I'm a middle school student. I filled out a survey. It was, it's, it's on my canvas. I filled out the survey. Then what happened? What happened so after there was a, There was an email sent to students that said, these are the programs that you're interested in. And the whole idea was in sharing this with the counselors that students <laughs> now know, for example, if you're interested in visual arts, this is where you can take, um, this is where the programs are available. These are the courses you might want to take. And so there absolutely is a requirement for follow-up conversations. You're correct. It's not one and done, which is, again, why having it as a resource in Canvas, which is why we're meeting with Dr. Cruz and her team with counseling to think about now that we have it's not enough just having the information, you're, you're correct. Now thinking about how can we use this information further to build student capacity and to make sure the adults who are supporting students, whether it's the middle school resource uh, counselor, high school counselor, empowering parents, and, and helping students understand what their choices are as they start the journey and when they get to high school. So both. Um, so uh, that's really good to hear. Um, so typically, middle school to high school course planning articulation happens what, like the last quarter of uh, eighth grade? And so for articulation in the fall, uh, winter, and then students um, begin the registration for high school courses in uh, January, February. So mm -hmm. usually in January, okay. high schools come and visit, and then February, students are filling out their, um, their registration. Let's course. back map a little bit. Then oh, Back map a little bit. Then this survey is pushed out. Um, seventh grade. Seventh grade. And then we collect this data. So in the ideal world, then the counselors get a list or the school get a list of a students interested in CTE programs and will be able to advise students the appropriate application timelines and Paperwork. Correct. And this do. information was sent um, to schools last um, at the uh, last June, and so we know that summers get busy. So it's a good time to revisit mm -hmm. and to just make sure we're all on the same page in terms of the supports available. Right. So. Um, is this a new thing? Yes. That, okay. So this was our first time doing it last year. We had a okay. beautiful welcome by Dr. McKnight. She welcomed all of the students, and um, yes, it was that last year was the first time. Okay. So then, so this is on the middle school counselor's plate now mm -hmm. to to yeah. do this. Okay. Yeah, one of the um, exciting pieces that we've also been working on in terms of building out a student's sense of what they might like and might be interested in in a career is through some of the blueprint development that we have to do. And there's a component in there called uh, career advising. And so we've worked with um, WorkSource Montgomery and a consultant who's done work around the in in a pathway called the world of work. Mm. And it's really about having students begin earlier to try and think about what their skills are, what their strengths are, what their interests are on a personal level mm -hmm. in order to then be able to find out more about what they might be uh, interested in a career. So it's sort of a combination. So this was seventh grade. This was a great idea where we got information from the students. Coming up this year and in a presentation soon to come, you'll find out more about what we're doing with our sixth grade students to really help them begin to uh, develop that sort that sense of identity and that sense of where they might want to go. So if we build it in a, in a pathway, career advising, every student would have access 
address to a person who's going to help them interpret and understand the information that is available about what they are interested in. And then they transition up to the seventh grade where they take a, a self-survey. And these are not the only tools. Then counselors have their Naviance. So I would say that it's not necessarily just an addition onto the counselors, but it is a part of a truly intentional way of making sure that our students are not waiting until the end of eighth grade to say, I guess I have to pick something, you mm -hmm. know, but that they're really trying to think about what they might want to, to do and to be in, in early in sixth grade. Okay, thank you. I just want to say, as in reference to your point about it falling on the uh, counselor's plate at the middle school level, this is part of why it was so important in our budget to include um, career um, additional uh, positions for career pathways and um, in all of that, you know, yeah. at the middle school Absolutely. level. So that Absolutely. it was not too late by the time yeah. they got to high school. Right, right. And, right. Um, <clears throat> and they could have these supports. Yeah. I, I will want to have the staff note down that for a follow-up. I want uh, uh, these high school credit courses we discussed for the 40 middle school, I want the names for the, high, uh, for the middle schools that offer these courses, if we can have a follow-up. And Ms. Yang, I did want to just follow up that 36 mm -hmm. middle schools offer the high school technology credit. Mm -hmm. I, think that's what I think you asked, or Ms. Harris asked, so 36 of them offer it. Okay, thank you. And just a, is that, um, I haven't seen this year's, the 20, the 23, 24 course catalog. I usually, I love that. I always use that, it's a great resource. Does the course catalog I know it does in high school, but in for the middle schools, does the course catalog identify what courses are available where? Yes. Okay. Exactly. So middle schools also have their digital version, mm -hmm. and they're able to list the courses that they offer, correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is Ms. Harris's Bible. <laughs> and she's got, given us great feedback, so thank you for that. We work closely with a group of students. Thank you. All right. Let's keep moving on right. in the interest Next of Next slide. Timing. Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. So one thing that we did want to uh, point out in terms of enriched and accelerated courses, you see that we have a variety of programs that are available to our students. So um, many of our high schools have unique programs that are available only at their schools. Um, you learned today about the number of uh, high schools that offer international baccalaureate, how we're expanding those opportunities. And again, with international baccalaureate back mapping to make sure that students in middle schools are ready then to successfully transition if they choose to do that to high schools with the IB program. Equal opportunity schools, we have 19 high schools that are equal opportunity schools and how important that feedback is in making sure that we know what's helping our students and you'll hear about that in a few minutes as well. We also have the career readiness programs, advanced placement, dual enrollment and our work-based learning. What's really nice in terms of work-based learning is that, and we'll speak to that again in a few minutes, is that we're thinking about in terms of internships and apprenticeships going out of the traditional path. So we have the, the, uh, the opportunities that we have traditionally considered, but now we're looking at healthcare. So thinking about what opportunities in terms of internships and apprenticeships are available, can we make available in healthcare, what's available in different uh, STEM industries, and so that way our students can earn those industry-recognized credentials. So when they transition to college, and again, it's not one or the other, they might have the credentials that they need to get a job to start working while they're going to college. And so really thinking about, again, K through 12 and beyond, and, uh, and being intentional in offering opportunities and maximizing what's available in MCPS. What's also really nice in terms of thinking all of our students, students who receive special education services, we're intentional in training the staff that works with students to make sure that they get their accommodations, that they get their services. Um, for students also who are multi emergent multilingual learners, thinking about what opportunities are available to them, looking at their strengths and not the deficit model, but looking at what within all of these programs, with all, within all of these opportunities, how can we make sure that students who need that challenge, students who are mastering the language, students who have different learning styles can access these opportunities. And I think that's where our strength is with over 100 programs, 51 CTE programs, international uh, baccalaureate, AP, dual enrollment. There are just so many opportunities. It's just a matter of finding the right match. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this is just um, shows some of the courses um, and some of the pathways, some of the programs that are available as a sampling. All of our high schools have um, a variety of courses that they offer. There's no high school that doesn't have any programs. So within our 11 pathways, all of our high schools have at least some programs in addition to their unique programs. Um, one thing that's also important to point out, while we have programs and we look at overall enrollment, um, as a team, we have been looking at enrollment of our focus students. So we have selected um, a certain um, number of high schools, and we're looking within those um, highly sought after programs, how many students who are applying and getting in, uh, admitted are students who receive special education services, how many students are EML, how many students are African American, Hispanic, how many students um, qualify for farms, to really narrow it down and to make sure that while the global numbers from that macro level might be positive, we really want to go um, deeper and see, look at our specific target groups and see, are we creating these opportunities for our students? And so one example that I did want to give you um, in thinking about the back mapping and preparing students for the high school level um, is um, looking at um, Project Lead the Way. And so this summer, for example, we were intentional in doing our, we did an um, innovative summer school program at one, at one of our middle schools, and we selected a middle school that feeds into a high school that has Project Lead the Way. And when we did the innovative learning, again, we uh, selected a group of students who traditionally might not have um, taken those courses in, in building their capacity and exposing them to this engineering concepts. Hopefully that students will then choose that pathway when they get to Payne Branch High School. And that's just one example. Next slide, please. And I will hand it now back to Ms. Gavula. Okay, so continuing with the high school tract, we have um, International Baccalaureate. Um, we have um, 18 middle schools and high schools combination, so um, that offer an IB program. So we have 10 middle schools that offer the middle years program, and they're listed there. We have uh, six, uh, six high schools that offer the middle years program, and then eight high schools that offer the uh, diploma program, and three of our high schools also offer the career program. Um, and one of the, I think, I want to highlight Seneca Valley because that's our, um, our up county big CTE program, and all of those programs can be paired with the IB career program. So students who do any of those, those pathways will also be able to earn the IB uh, diploma. Um, over the last two years, so last year and this year, just to look at some numbers, the um, numbers listed there are just for our 11th and 12th grade students um, for the diploma and career program students. So we are increasing numbers, um, and our schools work very hard to make sure that they give access to our special education students, to our EML students. We have a lot of EML students that take the uh, language courses and ex um, excel in those, and then our um, gifted uh, ident GTA identified students. Um, the other thing about International Baccalaureate is we have the three regional programs and the one countywide. So now um, we have uh, access to IB for all of our students in the county for high school um, through the regional programs and the, and the countywide. Uh, all of our high schools are also, our IB high schools are equal opportunity schools. Um, and I have, and then and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that is um, a partnership that we have with a nonprofit organization that helps us to reduce barriers um, for students to access advanced courses. And, um, and you can see that we are, we're working with that each year. We're getting a little bit more students um, into the IB programs and those courses. Not just full, all full candidates, but also just offering the courses. So if you were a student who is at um, Bethesda Chevy Chase and maybe you don't want to do all of your courses in IB and be the full candidate, you can still take your science as an IB course or your history as an IB course. So we have that option in all of our schools. Okay, next slide. All right. Um, so Equal Opportunity Schools is, uh, like I said, a partnership and we're trying to reduce barriers and increase access to AP and IB courses in 19 of our high schools. Um, and not only just um, um, provide access, but also support students while they are in those courses and make sure that they have a sense of belonging, that they know that we want them there in those courses, they deserve to be there, and that we want them to be successful. So this is just um, our impact by the numbers from this school year leading into, uh, from last school year leading into this one. And um, <clears throat> last year, uh, the fall participation projection was uh, 58%, and the schools worked really hard last year, all 19 of them, that we now ha have 64% of our students who um, were on their outreach list are participating in APRIB. So very exciting um, with that. 
uh, advanced placement. Um, our numbers are right there for advanced placement. They are increasing. We also, it's very exciting that we have um, an increase in um, our AP seminar and AP, which leads to AP research and AP capstone. Currently, we have um, five schools that offer the AP capstone. And next year, it'll be up to 11 watts, six more schools, because uh, schools are asking um, to include the AP seminar course. And we have our English 10 AP seminar pilot in a few of our schools this year. So that's also increasing that. Okay. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so here um, we mentioned, um, uh, we talked a little bit about Project Lead the Way, and what's really exciting that in addition to the 13 high schools that offer the pathway and 16 middle schools, um, we have we are expanding the the opportunities to the elementary school level. So again, being very intentional in the back mapping, thinking about what are the concepts, what do students need to know to successfully transition or to successfully complete this pathway, and so our tech team is working very closely with the curriculum team and we have introduced um, the concepts of Project Lead the Way to four elementary schools where students are learning about robotics and computational thinking. We also started a middle school gateway program which is available at four middle schools to sixth and seventh graders and this also explores the engineering mindset and looks at career fields, hands-on problem solving and again computational thinking. What's also nice um, with students who have this opportunity um, that they're able to take courses that vary, um, um, go all the way from engineering design to aerospace engineering. So that would be one of the examples um, of a high school um, enriched pathway. The next um, slide, please, what I also wanted to share, and we um, talked about dual enrollment as well. So we are very excited that for dual enrollment, um, we have five different programs. Um, so while some are for our application base, Jumpstart to College allows any student um, to take college level courses at Montgomery College at no cost. Um, and they can, students can select from over 475 courses. We have 23 degrees. And again, you can notice that uh, we have, um, f uh, looking at the cumulative data over the last three years, um, 540 emergent multilingual students who took advantage of these courses, and over 203 students um, who received special education services. What's also nice in giving students the opportunity to take courses um, at the college level and earn those college credits is that in terms of students who receive special education services, um, we are able to make sure that um, they are able to access their disability support services um, at Montgomery College college and that they're getting the support um, that they need to successfully complete those courses or to successfully complete um, their associate's degree. Next slide, please. And this is um, also another um, opportunity for acceleration and enrichment. This is our work-based learning. So work-based learning is not only um, one of the critical components of our strategic plan, but this is also part of our blueprint work. And so making sure that students not only is part of their completion for their different programs, that they're accessing either internships or college-level courses, but that we're thinking and intentionally creating more opportunities, again, for students to be able to access internship and apprenticeship. We're really excited. Last year, we had 11 students who were registered for apprenticeship. This year, our number's 32. So we are growing it. Um, in terms of internship, also working closely with our schools um, to make sure that the, our um, uh, counselors who are uh, college and career counselors who are in internship coordinators who are supporting students with um, different opportunities that they're aware of what's available to students. And so one thing that um, is still a challenge for for us in looking at Montgomery County and our landscape, thinking about how can we engage more intermediaries. We need more businesses to take large scales numbers of students. So one thing that we have committed to all of the high schools who offer students internships, uh, we don't think that it should be up to the teacher to go out into the community and find those business partners. It should not be up to the students to go into the community and find an internship for themselves. That's something that we need to provide. And so we have created a platform where all of the students 
students can see what's available throughout MCPS. It's not specific to their high school. It's not a manila folder that you go into and you can look at four businesses that are available in Damascus versus the manila folder in downtown Bethesda, but that it's one, one platform available for all students. And then we want to make sure, again, that we increase the number of opportunities for both paid and unpaid internship and as well as um, apprenticeships. And now I'm going to pass it on to... Can I ask... Yes, please. So um, I always feel there are a million people out there watching our board meetings, you know. But, Did you say uh, a million? A million, a million. We have a 1.1, 1.2 million population. I think the majority of them watch this. And I also feel like it, um, all the videos are useful tools to get to the public. So I often feel like... Um, we need to do some demonstrations, if it's possible, because just now we mentioned two things, and I'm thinking, boy, it would be so nice if we have the demonstration. One, you mentioned about the career, the CTE survey, sitting on students' uh, Canvas mm -hmm. platform. That would be a nice thing that if we can say, watch from this minute to this minute, that's how you can, you know, county-wide. Or if it can be uploaded to our website on the CTE page, if there is a small demonstration, a TikTok video or whatever video of one minute, how to find it, I think that will be very helpful for our families. Now, you just also mentioned that you are, are you creating or is it already created a platform for uh, internship, a internship? It already exists. Mm -hmm. And is it on our website? Schools have access to it. Um, so the schools are able to see what um, what's available in terms of internships. And then we're looking at growing that and making sure that um, that Every, every single school is using that platform, which has been a transition, right? So over the years, schools have kept their own lists mm -hmm. um, in the Manila folder style, and we just feel like with 2023, it was mm -hmm. time to transition mm -hmm. to a platform. And also in terms of equity, we wanted every child, regardless of their school zip code, to have access to the same opportunities. So right now, it's not accessible for families and students yet? I'll have to double check. I, I believe okay. that only the uh, schools have access to it, but okay. let me double check on that. That, that mm -hmm. will be a good information to have, but a uh, suggestion will be students to go to talk to their internship coordinator mm -hmm. or their CCICs at their high school. Exactly. Thank you. Thank and you. We do, have, yes. we do have the videos mm -hmm. on both the platform and within the Canvas course, but I think you brought up an excellent point in terms of TikTok. So okay. we have to think about narrowing things down because yeah. sometimes a video that we think is great and it's seven minutes, mm -hmm. um, folks are not going to sit through a video for seven, right? right? right. So, so narrowing right. it down and making it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think uh, uh, we have a beautiful website, much more modern uh, looking website. If we can put this on our website, I think that helps the families, right? And when we talk about middle school kids, they still need some uh, guidance. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And thank on thank our you school's for... websites, not just MCPS's website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have a, I don't know if I would say it's a question as much as it's a concern. Um, none of this information is broken down by race or, um, you know, uh, subgroups. Um, are we tracking that? Like, yes. you know, how we many have people it. are? We have it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We do have it. So that's that can be provided as? Mm -hmm. Yep. We absolutely do have it. Okay. Because it's nice to see yes. how many people are applying to these programs, but if we're not targeting the groups that we have worked so hard to make sure there are on-ramps for and, um, and access to, then... We do, and we had two memos that we um, shared um, last year that include all the data in them. So um, that's also, I believe it's in the appendix available, and Ms. Franklin's going to speak to that a little bit more. Okay. And also a question follow-up about the internship opportunity. So which office have been tasked to build out this internship opportunity list? Is it your office? That's correct. And okay, we're really um, excited and proud of the work that we're doing. Right. And um, in terms of the X2Vol, which is the platform for the internships, all okay. students do have access. I just learned that all, all of the students do have access to that data, and they have access to it through their Naviance accounts. Oh, so it's in their Naviance mm -hmm. account. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's so we are, we're so doing this work, and we're, we're really excited. Okay. Wonderful. Great information. Thank you, Ms. Singh. And I'm going to pass it out to Ms. Franklin. Actually, I have a question. Um, 
Looking at the dual enrollment option, and you mentioned uh, there are 475 courses available at MC that MCPF students can potentially take, which is a dramatic expansion from just three years ago um, when I was working on a project um, to make to bring dual enrollment classes to Edison for our, our students who were there half a day. Um, but one of the one of the, two of the, the two. I don't want to call them obstacles, but two considerations for students, at least historically, were for the limited number of courses that were available, they had prerequisites. And not every, you, you couldn't just say, I want to take the course. You had to have, you know, had a certain grade in Algebra 2, for instance, or you had to have scored, you know, a certain, taken a certain English class and, and, and done, uh, you know, had a certain score on a WIDA, something like that. Um, so, if those kinds of eligibility requirements still exist, are those being really clearly shared with students in advance? So they don't say get to be a junior and say, oh, I'm, I'm just going to take, I've got all these MC courses that are available to me. I'm just going to do that from now on. And they won't have taken, you know, their, their past trajectory won't have gotten them the eligibility that they need to take the courses that they're interested in. So is that something that we're sharing very, very transparently with students about those 475 courses? That's a really good question. And while we provide guidance, I think it's something that we can always improve. And I can just share the specifics of that with you. Um, and then um, the other question was, so 475 courses at MC, that's amazing. Um, are those automatically qualified to satisfy graduation credit requirements in the relative field area. So they have to have three science, they have to have three history, they have to have four English, they have to have math every year they're in high school, what a silly requirement, um, you know, tech, fine art. So if a kid, uh, if a student um, is taking a fine arts course at MC, does that automatically check that fine art credit box? Uh, no, it's not automatic. It just depends on the course and um, and what the course. There has to be a match, and um, it's not automatic. No. So has that work been done, and is that information also being very transparently shared with students? So if they take these fine arts courses mm -hmm, at mm -hmm, MC, mm -hmm. they will satisfy that that high school graduation credit requirement, and these won't, same with English, same with math, communications, that kind of thing, so yeah. that students can be really, I mean, they are sharp and strategic in their thinking, mm -hmm. and so they're going to, mm -hmm. they're far more likely to take the courses that will check their boxes for them. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, the high schools have dual enrollment um, uh, special, uh, coordinators who work with students, and but I can definitely follow up and, and share the specifics of how that's being done and what's being communicated. So yeah. this, this is another demonstration uh, opportunities uh, when we have this conversation. Say, I can put up the list of the courses at MC and what MCPS credit is satisfied on that. Uh, on that. So I think our committee meetings can be a good opportunities to have this kind of demonstration so that, you know, people understand, yeah. yeah. But it is there, the information is there, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to jump in. Yes. Um, do this again. <laughs> so I'm going to jump in, and it's, um, want to go to the ne next slide, please? So we put the number 70 up here just so that you see the conversation has really been about a lot of the opportunities that we have in our local schools, our local elementary, our local middle, and our high schools. In addition, we do have regional programs that are available from K to 12 as well. But the majority of our students attend their local schools, and so robust programming, interesting programming, high engaging programming and services need to be in our local schools. But we do have, going into full-time programs, we have 70 different programs. We have 33 that are for full-time students who are rising 9 through 12. And then for we have 37 um, for students going part-time programs from not, um, grade 10 through 12. So the idea of on-ramps is very much alive in this example because we want to make sure that when students blossom, there are opportunities for them to explore different programs. Um, these programs, again, are their centralized admission process. and. Um, 
Lots of information is sent to families in English and Spanish. We start sending information out through multiple media. We use Facebook. We use our communications team. We use our parent engagement teams. Um, our most effective process is really working with our middle schools and asking them to target families. Um, and so we give them last year's data. This is how the application uh, participation went. And the goal is not more applicants. The goal is awareness and value. Uh, we have families who say, oh, we know about these programs, but we also realize that families have very different values about the programs. And so we want to make sure that we are working with different groups of families to have them understand that this is what it offers, this is what the benefit of the programs are, um, and families tell us information such as, we don't want to leave our home school, we really like our, our feeder middle school, our feeder high schools, all of that is wonderful. But we just want to make sure that families are beyond awareness that they also have value about um, these programs. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to reintroduce this slide because what um, Ms. LaGrange showed you was that this is a sampling of all the different programs, and this is just a sampling. There are so many themes in MCPS. We have over 160,000 students, so our goal is to serve their interests and their needs. But the ones that are highlighted are the ones in yellow are the ones highlighted um, are, those are available regionally. So not all of them are highlighted. So what that shows you is that we have just as many high engaging programs regionally where we can serve a critical mass of students and then we also have numerous of them locally. And again, most of our students do uh, um, attend their local schools. Um, when students apply to the schools, because this is a question I believe that will come up, um, We'll have a number of our students apply for the full-time program starting grade nine. And then we'll have some students invited to up to 20, potentially, because some students are eligible for that many. Um, but when we go to look at the data, why students decline them, um, one of the things that does happen is once students are invited to programs, the local schools reach out to them and let them know. By the way, just wanted you to know that we also have a technology pathway available at our school, and you'd be part of our school, and we want you back. Um, another option might be that two weeks later, they get invited to another program because they're on the wait list for another program. So the goal is that students are not interested in just one. Students are interested in multiple programs. And so the goal is to try to connect them, and that they're not we don't keep them there. We want students to explore, and everything that they learn in one pathway can be transferred to another pathway. Because what you learn about yourself is just important as what you like and what you don't like when it comes to the content. So this is um, a, just another example of the variety of ways that we're trying to serve students. Next slide, please. So let's just take a look at some of our data. So we took a couple of our programs, interest-based and our um, criteria-based high school programs. And we have roughly 33 programs that we have um, eligible for students. And some students are eligible for up to 20. So if you look here, we I highlighted IB at Springbrook, the aviation program at Magruder, biosciences at Gaithersburg, healthcare at Wheaton, and the Visual Arts Center, and that's at Einstein. And we broke it down into our special populations. And as you can see, we have um, this all by percentages. Um, and this is really about access. So this is not talking about enrollment because enrollment is happening right now, and so we want to make sure to capture that data. But we wanted to give you a picture of access. Students have access. So if we look at our ELD and our special education students, we have a range of access and some of the areas we're going to need to look at, such as our special education students, we have 5% or less um, accessing programs. But we need to unpack that before we make a judgment about what that means. Um, when we look at the farms data, MCPS current farms is roughly 39.6% um, based on our, um, at a glance. So some of our programs are within the range and some of our programs are outside of that range. So what this is just demonstrating is that students who are receiving farm services are also accessing programs. Now, we didn't list all the programs, so I just wanted to highlight a few of the interests and the criteria base, but then we are doing further analysis to look at this information. The other piece that's really important about this data is that this information, each of the principals, the sending 
high school principals get information about the numbers of students that are accepting programs outside of their school. Because that's important for them to know, well, I have a large cohort of students who want technology that we don't necessarily offer the pathway they're looking for. Why don't we look at that for course scheduling? Because the goal is also programming in place. So we want to offer programs that might be cost prohibitive to offer in every high school in regional programs. And so this is an example of what this might look like. This data as well is available to you. Um, we do our annual memo. It was released on August 16th. Um, we can make that available to you again. But it's a lovely 19-page document um, <laughs> with color. And it just highlights all of the different racial ethnicity groups um, just so you have a sense of who's accessing, who has access to programs. Next slide, please. Is that included in the appendix? Right. It might be included in the appendix. If not, I can send it to you by email right now in a second. Okay. Did you, I was going to say, did you, know the, did you know some of the breakdown at all? No. Ms. Pugh? No? No, I'm sorry. So if we go, so if you wanted to know a little bit of the breakdown, so. Um, well, let's start here. This is a good place to start here. So this is a snapshot of students who are currently enrolled in the regional IBs grade 10 through 12. And so this is one of the most recent work that the board has done in the past few years to install three new regional IBs at Watkins Mill, Springbrook, and John F. Kennedy. And the reason why those places were very important, one, those schools had space. Two, those schools were graduating number of students in our focus groups with an IBDP program um, without the establishment of a cluster group at the very beginning. So we wanted to build upon that because you already have a leadership that's in place. You already have um, school staff that are championing this idea. So the idea here is how do we build this? We had numbers of students applying to the countywide program at Richard Montgomery. So we wanted to open this up. We have eight high schools that offer it. So now expanding it to three more high schools provides more opportunity for students to be part of a cluster group. And the cluster group, the idea here is this. When you start together in grade nine, and you've seen this in college admissions, and you've seen this in organizations, when you start together, you're a team. You're a smaller learning community in grade nine. You take a few courses together, and you're part of this academic journey. Then when you start to get involved in your 11th grade, the actual time when IBD, IBDP starts, Sometimes the challenge for students starts to increase, but you are surrounded by your academic peers and your intellectual peers who are going to say, we can do this together, we'll form study groups. The goal is completion, and that's what our um, research has showed us, is that when students start programming together, they're more likely to complete together, and that's our goal. We have this excellent resource that provides excellent opportunities for students to go into college right away and get them ready. So we wanted to ensure that they had all of the elements to participate. So this is an example of students. This is roughly uh, 1,500 students who took, um, who are enrolled in the, um, in a, a cohorted English class in grade 10. And this is showing you what the data is. Um, I know that the APIB data also report is annually pub published mm -hmm. for the board. So that's additional information for you. But this is showing you the different service groups. We have 5% of the students who are in there who are EML students. We have 6% of the students who are students with disabilities. And 61% of the students are farms. Now, why is that number so large? Well, just kind of share that because of the board's installment of those three high schools where there are large numbers of students receiving farms, this is where those numbers. So access is definitely being granted, and we are seeing successes there. Um, when these, just so you know, when these started, it was their, the student's first year was our first year of remote. <laughs> and so you change school remotely was a very big challenge for these students. So these schools worked really hard to retain these students and have them continue to participate. And they've been quite successful with that. So mm -hmm. there's just a lot of positive energy to ensuring that students have um, strong access and solid access to these programs. So you'll see some of our notes here that we're continuing to ad address access for EML and um, students with disabilities as part of our strategic plan. So that is front and center. And then we are demonstrating there's access um, for students who are receiving farms um, for regional IBs, and so and continue want to wanting to, that to grow. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, 
I'm sorry, may I go back to the, the, the previous slide because um, Ms. Smondrowski wanted to ask a little bit about the race piece. So I, I wanted to also mention that in the data that we will share again with you uh, regarding the snapshot. So for every one of our programs, for the full-time programs, we do break down the race ethnicity for you and then also farm. So it'll, it'll give you a sense of where we're having um, some successes. And so the regional IBs is where we're having greatest success of large numbers of African American, Latino students, um, and um, two or more races. Um, those are that's where we're having lots of growth, and that's intentional. That was so, the local IBs you said at the regional IBs oh. at the regional IBs. Yes. So the idea because that data is significantly different when it was just Richard Montgomery IB. So that's what that work is doing, is definitely providing access and graduating more students with the IBDP program mm -hmm. as a result of creating these new pathways. You did say that you have the um, in internships broken down by race as well, is that correct? I will get that to you. Thank you. And so I'd like to now pass it off to Dr. Pugh. Thank you. So next slide, please. I think what we pre shared with you today gives you a nice overview of what opportunities are available. Clearly, we could probably spend three hours talking about CTE, the same three hours talking about dual enrollment, um, probably another three hours about each of the programs that we have, because there's a lot of opportunity here for our students. And I think, actually, when we look at our strategies, when we were thinking through our next steps, uh, I, didn't th I wasn't thinking Twitter, but maybe. Um, the, the first piece is to ensure we have broad access uh, to those opportunities and making sure that where you go to school doesn't limit you in terms of being able to access enriched and accelerated opportunities. The second piece is to make sure that we have specific outreach plans, you know, that we hear from our communities about what support it, it is that they need to be able to help their children make choices um, in their middle school years. And then finally, increasing that targeted communication about the programs that are available and really helping to connect our middle schools with our high schools so that our students can see themselves in high school and participating in some of the programs that match their strengths. And so with that, Next slide, we'll move into any more discussion. Ms. Yang. Yes, hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, impressive, uh, we clearly as a school system offer a lot of programs and pathways for our students. Um, that is very exciting. Now, I want to ask a question. So in the past and in the future, have we evaluated these programs, right? Um, take an example of our uh, um, CTE program, right? Um, uh, you know, how are we evaluating them? What's the outcome? Uh, look at our regional program. We have some are new, um, but yeah, not that new. It has been three or four years, uh, right? And we have some long-standing one, the global ecology, math, you know, technology. Do we ever track any data? What does it show? Does it our, do our elementary enrichment accelerated centers, what kind of result is giving us? What about our middle school programs? What about our high school programs? So do we do anything to evaluate and, and, and show the results? It certainly. So um, we um, have, for, I, I will speak to the CTE programs. So we have um, data that we look at and we have data that goes pre-COVID and of course all of our CT programs were significantly impacted during COVID. So we are able to track the programs, look at the enrollment over several years. Um, and then also one, one change that is going to be significant in terms of our CTE programs is that traditionally we have looked at CTE enrollment, right? So we were looking at you know how many students are enrolled and then because of uh, the CTE pathway can be anywhere from three to five courses with a, co with a complete and the capstone at the end, which can be done through an internship, through um, a course, um, through Montgomery College or through a portfolio. One thing that we noted is that some of the schools were offering some of the courses as electives. So they might take one course from this CTE path or another course, and there wasn't um, the expectation
expectation or the monitoring to see how many students were actually completing the programs. And we know that now with the blueprint, there's a change. So with the blueprint, we are going to have to look at program completion. So that's also going to be something that we are going to have to look at and have a conversation with schools and look at what are the expectations for completion, what are the expectations in terms of the, of the industry recognized credentials, how many students are taking those assessments after the end of the course. Um, one of the questions that we were already asked by students is, would we consider making some of those higher level CT courses honors courses, which is a very legitimate question. Some of the other districts do that. So if you are completing a higher level CT course, could that be considered an honors course? That's something we will be exploring as well. Um, so in terms of the programs, we do look at that. Um, the other uh, factor that we have to consider is whether or not the program is new. Um, so some of our new programs, they need a couple of years for them to grow those numbers. Um, we also have to look at the staffing. Do we have the available staff? Um, do we have teachers who can teach those courses? So that's also something, for example, with healthcare, with some of our higher level technology courses, making sure that we have enough staff who can teach those courses. So yes, we have the data uh, and we have, uh, we know which programs are thriving, which programs have waiting lists and which programs have not been thriving for a while. So now the question is, as our next step, you know, to determine what do we do uh, with that information and how do we help schools transition? If there is a program that is not, has not been successful for years, could we consider shifting and pivoting to one program that might be more successful, especially now that we have middle school student voice data? We can say, you know, for your high school, the middle school students who are coming to you, these are their interests. Have you considered, do you have programs that match? Do you have courses that match? And of course, we know that it takes time to grow CTE um, programs, multiple courses, teacher professional learning. So um, certainly something that we are going to be looking at, um, at the in the next couple of years, um, especially as it pertains to the blueprint. Ms. Hazel. And last spring, we did a presentation around uh, programs, and uh, we talked about one of our recommendations was to add more of that evaluation component. Mm -hmm. um, we know starting from elementary all the way up, we often look at participation data, demographics, but that academic component is the one area that we need to continue um, in working with Office of Shared Accountability to support us in evaluating um, the success of those programs um, for all of our students. So we're working with them, and um, we also have some um, community collaboration um, committees that we work with to identify um, where to start, because there are so many. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's so we kind of getting ourselves on a rotation around which programs to, to evaluate and when. I understand that this year we got a schedule. I think the enrichment programs the, uh, for elementary school is on the rotation of the 10 programs that are being evaluated. Um, one of my long time, you know, um, concern or question was um, we, we spent uh, all this money uh, the families spend all this time having their children bus to different schools, right, for this program. And, and we need to know what the outcome is, right? And, 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 and uh, that it, are we really uh, achieving what we plan to do? And another thing is I think that um, I myself uh, have a long time been uh, confused, and I don't know whether um, GT education equals accelerated education or enriched education, you know, and that is a concept I'm still uh, trying to grapple with. And, uh, and so, um, but excited to hear that program evaluation is there, excited to hear that CTE completion industry credential is something that we're paying attention to. Thank you. Yeah, I do want to just say thank you for those two summaries. Um, I, um, it's the return, looking at the turn, return on our investments and things like that is something that, you know, we've been talking about for a very long time. Um, it's nice to see that that's, that stuff is coming. I do want to take a quick minute and um, express my ap sincere apologies. I, I failed to um, introduce our associate superintendent from uh, curriculum and, and instruction, uh, Nikki Hazel. And I didn't know if you wanted to um, recognize the other members in the audience who took the time to join us here today. Okay, thank you. Well, we have uh, Tamara 
Tamara Hewlett, who is our director in the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education. And uh, we have Diana Wiles, who is the Associate Superintendent of Special Education. Great. Thank you. I know there was somebody else here before, but um, as well, but I just always very much appreciate when people take the time to join the millions of viewers who are watching us, <laughs> not just from Montgomery County, by the way, it's worldwide, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to acknowledge you all and thank you very much for your participation, especially for joining us impromptu like that. Uh, I am Miss Eric, you have? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of uh, wrap up questions and one <clears throat> goes to, um, something we've talked about before, and that is, you know, we have, um, for some students who are lucky enough to get into them, mm -hmm. uh, a K-8 opportunity for immersion. But once they finish eighth grade, that language immersion opportunity is gone, pretty much. And so what are we doing to enrich the opportunities for those students who once they get into high school, you know, you know, Spanish four is just not going to do it. Even AP language is not going to do it for them because they've already had eight years. So are we creating additional opportunities or is the Montgomery College, I'm not familiar enough with their world language department, but is that an opportunity for these students? How are we supporting that and sort of honoring what they've accomplished by the eighth grade by saying, okay, mm -hmm. here's more. Yeah, because they also lose their cohorts of, of mm -hmm. students that they've traveled through, um, some of them since kindergarten, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to participate. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're reaching for your mic. Um, <laughs> so we're really excited. Uh, you know, we started two-way immersion yes. a few years ago, and those students have now, many of them are moving to middle school. And so um, building out more language opportunities there. and continuing that work so that when they get to high school, we want to definitely provide more than just a course. Um, but that is work that we're doing now to build out to for the high school experience. So a couple years out, um, we do hope to have that cohort of students being able to have more language opportunities uh, at the high school level, including our partnerships with uh, colleges and universities. Okay. Can I just uh, follow up yeah. with that? Um, because this is something that we've talked about um, over time. Um, are you still looking at all at maybe opening sort of a, an international um, high school where it would be, you know, it would incorporate two folds, one welcoming our, our newcomers and giving them an opportunity to be able to access resources locally in, in strength uh, and as well as making it something for our students who really are focused on dual languages or multilang you know, being multilingual. You want to answer that? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, w so yes, we did look at uh, several different models, Prince George's County, and, and I think where we left it last is that we were encouraged to look outside of and look nationally to see some additional models. So yes, that is work to be done on international school combining it with a newcomer. Mm -hmm. But I also would say that students who are starting their language, their dual language um, journey with us now, those are the students that are going to have every opportunity in careers to be able to leave us with the ability to be completely bilingual. And that gives you a, a, a higher level of access, right? Our students currently, through the World Language Program, when they leave us, they are already literate at the speaking, reading, writing, and listening level. So they are just at the, uh, close to what you would need to be to be a teacher of world language. So combining them with not only their, their language abilities, but combining them with a career within which they would use those language uh, abilities at the high school level is something that's interesting to explore too. Engineering is one, nursing is another, biotechnology is another. Those are all languages, right, all, all uh, career pathways that if a student is multilingual, they have every access to positions all over the world. And I think that is our intentionality. Um, so it may not look like dual language, and uh, that's a way to start, but it's a way to then have them paired with a career that is going to also help them benefit from being multilingual. So just out of curiosity, um, 
I know that we as a, a committee um, a, had asked for that follow-up information last year, and I do believe as a full board, we also requested that that information. When do you think that the reaching out to those other schools will be finished? Well, we will be sending you an updated um, memo, but we are continuing to work with other districts, um, looking at other districts mm -hmm. and, and doing that research now. So we have an update that we want to be able to provide you in writing. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ms. Harris. Yep. Um, and so my next question goes to a little bit of the history, but also looking at the data that we're collecting now about the, who, who is taking the, the, the courses, this wide array of, of opportunity that we're providing. So when we, we did the meta study in 2015, 2016, it told us what we already knew, which was you know the opportunity to get into the courses that we've called many things over the years, and now we call our Center for Enriched Studies for elementary school students, was, was not equitable. Um, it was too focused on parents who paid attention and read every email and every newsletter and filled out all the forms and made their kids do this, you know, study in advance. And so we, we moved to the universal screening to make sure that every, every rising third grader or was being screened, or every third grader was being screened. And then um, what we were told, so we increased the number of, of CES schools, CES programs, but what we've been told is that that universal screening identified many, 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 many more students than we ever realized that we had mm -hmm. who were ready for enriched instruction. And since we couldn't accommodate them all in special programs, that we would make sure that every elementary school could provide that enrichment. And then since we had such a limited number of uh, enriched programs in middle school, we would make sure every middle school had a cohort that we were supporting um, with enrichment. And so sort of my question is for years the 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 truth was that that students that at, in elementary school got into what was GT and then with CES they they were dramatically overrepresented in our criterion based or application based magnets at Tacoma Park Eastern um, MLK and Clemente and then our highly competitive high school programs at Poolsville, at RM, at, at Blair, were also dramatically overrepresented by students that came from those middle school magnets. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing from students in those programs today is that that's still the case. So what is our data showing us now that we, since 2017, 18, have been saying we're gonna make enrichment available to mm -hmm. every student regardless of school, even if they're not in a CES, even if they're not in at Tacoma Park, Eastern, Clemente, or MLK, are we seeing that the num that the percentage of students occupying those highly competitive middle school and high school programs are no longer overrepresented by students coming through those special enriched programs? Long question. No, but it goes back to my original first yeah. question about what is enrichment. So. Um, this is a really good question and something that we're tackling. So what we have seen in the past five years in particular is a huge robust of growth in interest-based high school programs. So we grew the MC squared, we have aviation, we have P-TECH, um, we grew the three regional IB. So we're growing programs and the idea is there's so much available in, in high schools already um, and most high school students want to stay because this is, these, this is their cohort of students. They want to graduate with them. They want to participate in athletics or extra curriculars, um, the marching band, all of these good things. So we want to make sure we have a rich, robust experience. Um, but that, but we've also grown programs. So what we have seen is that data for the highly competitive mm -hmm. programs. Now let's just be reminded that Visual Arts Center, Poolsville is not as longstanding as like Blair um, or Richard Montgomery, but Richard Montgomery and the Blair Magnet programs, those are very longstanding. Mm -hmm. They have a and they have established a, a reputation that is untouched, right? Because they've just been there so long and they've had incredible programming. Um, when you look at the data, the data has incrementally changed over time. Um, but we have to ask the question, is it, we have students applying to a variety of different programs. And so what we haven't been able to do at large lengths is examine how many students have been invited to a variety of different programs and then decline another program to go to another program. So an example, we've looked at it in middle schools. In middle schools, we'll have students who are invited through the Central Review 
to, for example, Tacoma Park, and then also applied to Parkland or Argyle or Lloydman. And so we're look seeing. Um, initially, we were saying that students would first take when it was application based for Eastern Tacoma Park, those programs, that students would always take the criteria based over the interest based. But now that we have, we've done the central review and at both the elementary and middle school levels, we are seeing that the students are almost like 40% to 60%. So if Jeannie Franklin was invited to both, I have a 60% of maybe accepting the criteria base such as Eastern Tacoma Park over Parkland, but when before it was nearly 100. So what we're seeing is a shift because the program offerings are becoming distinctively different and we're trying to make families aware of that. Mm -hmm. Because before the reputation of these programs were so installed that it was so hard to change parents' minds about, we just want you to be aware of all the different opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so we are seeing a shift in that. High school, it's a little bit more difficult, but part of it is that before we make a judgment, we wanna make sure that we're really clear about, is it because we have numerous programs and these other programs are attracting um, a certain kind of student. Some students don't like competitive entry. And that's not the goal. The goal is not to go have to go through competitive entry. The goal is to match you with a program that is going to enrich your high school expectations and challenge you. So those are some of the questions that we have to examine. But the data has incrementally changed um, over the past five to 10 years. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I'll be interested to take a okay. kind of a deeper dive on that. Mm -hmm. um, the question you mentioned earlier, so the, with the project lead, to way, lead the Way, 13 high schools, 16 middle schools, and now the ES launch in four schools, in four elementary schools where the Project Lead the Way beginnings is, I guess, middle wrapped into the science. They're launching in middle, four more middle schools. E elementary oh, really? school, four elementary schools, you said, and in the elementary schools, it's incorporated in the science curriculum. So what are those elementary schools and how were they chosen? Because I'm guessing that requires some a unique professional development for the science or for the the teachers in those. And is that also in the elementary schools? Is that K five get the exposure to the project lead the way? Or is it just the older grades? Great question. So the four elementary schools um, that are part of the program are Cola, George and Forrest, are Roscoe Nix, and um, Sergeant Shriver. And uh, for the four uh, middle schools, I'll have to get that data to you, but at the middle schools, it's for grades six and seven, okay. and it's um, for the engineering mindset. So we have the six, uh, 16 <coughs> middle schools already standing, plus four more, and then 13 high schools. And I will have to get back to you and let you know how these four were selected. What's really nice is that the tech team, the tech department, um, and um, department's one person, um, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have been working very closely with the curriculum team and looking again um, where are the opportunities for robotics, where are the opportunities for innovative learning and, um, and doing teacher professional learning and making sure that we have the supplies, the, the robotics, whatever they need um, for those courses. Okay. And just so you know, that two of those elementary schools are, are innovative counties. Yeah, I noticed that. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did too. I was They've actually been doing impressed. it from the beginning. Um, right. And then that's, that's good. just the last observation I have, so as we talked about lots of ways, lots of opportunities, how are we making sure that students, families are, are very well aware of the opportunities and how to access them? Um, I, I noticed, you know, one place that, you know, we have our course catalog and things like that, but one place that we also note the programming that's available at a school is in the schools at a glance. So is this, is there sort of a, a routinized process where as our pilots happening and all these programs are growing and expanding that every year we're being really careful to make, because I know some people that they, they may not look at any other source, but they're going to look at a schools at a glance. So are we making sure that we're really updating those so that they're accurate year to year as these things do change? So I will get back to you about the schools at a glance, but what's really interesting is that um, in addition to the communication that we are doing um, this summer, our, our two apprentices created an additional uh, video 
video for work-based learning. That's another way to communicate. And then with the course bulletin, um, we also this summer um, did a review of all 25 high schools. And what we noticed is that um, the way that they're displayed, the way that they're sharing the information is, is different. Yeah. And so again, this is where the student voice was critical because to us, sometimes we know where to look. And so we're able to find the information, um, but we did um, in, in our internal audit, we were able to find where the information was not as easily um, available or it was a bit confusing, where it was difficult to find certain information about pathways, courses, work-based learning. And so that's the feedback that we will be providing back, um, back to schools. And so that's also because I think sometimes one of the issues is that those of us who have the paper copy of the course bulletin, it seems very logical, it's, you follow it, but for parents who are only looking at the digital platform and for students, it's a different experience. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to mention, at least for the regional program, so in eighth grade, all students in um, the parent view and student view will receive an eligibility report of the regional program. So it first just outlines, check out the great programs at your local school, but in addition, because of your middle school and where you live, here are all the different programs you can apply to and consider. So that's another um, option that's available, and then we share that with the counselors who can also help families as well. So a personalized letter that they get. So the updated at a glance is, a, is an excellent idea. The also, uh, I want to bring us back to when we came before you with program distribution. One of the action steps there or the recommendations was to create a process for program distribution that included a total look at a school and looking at participation of programs in a school and the variety of things that are um, impacted by the school. And so Ms. Hazel has been working with Ms. Edwards to really come up with that um, process. We shared an outline of what that was in terms of when a, anyone wants to start a new program that before school sites are selected that there is a hugely uh, representative discussion around what is available at that school currently and what the point purpose of it is so that then when it comes before the administrative leadership team to sort of consider whether that's a good match or not mm -hmm. that they have all of the information so I think we're all saying the same thing is that information is only as good as when we use it and when we can access it and when it's available for both decision making, monitoring, accountability, selection for families and students. Um, so I just wanted to remind you of that um, process. Question about the IB, regional IB programs. Are they all full? No, there's still room to grow. And when somebody applies to the Richard Montgomery IB program, and we know there's a waiting list. Are they then, if they do not get in, if they're put on the waiting list, are they referred, are they given the opportunity to automatically be enrolled into one of the ones that's not full? We share information with the families. So at the application time, they can apply to the regional one and the countywide one. Mm -hmm. And if they only applied to the countywide one and didn't get invited, we do send information um, saying if you would like to be considered. So we don't make an assumption um, because I think we tried that the first year and we had a little bit of pushback from some families about that. But what so what we do now is just we um, provide some information to families to give us some additional consideration. But the other part is that because we have the program already in place, um, the next step is if we do have seats to be filled, um, the local schools can do another review of their local students that have been assigned to them, um, new students that have been assigned to them, and then invite them to the program to fill seats. The goal is to ensure that we have a critical mass of students mm -hmm. to continue and complete. So we're Jeez. still building. Just concerned that people still don't see them all as being equal. Yes. And, um, yes. You know, the more we can encourage those who are sitting on a waiting list that want to be in a program to attend their regional program, the less there will be differentiation that will be between them. So, yeah, just, and, and the one thing that is very distinctly different is that we have three regionals that pulls from a catchment of schools mm -hmm. and then we have a countywide. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at what that message sends to our community. Exactly my point. Yeah. And not to put anybody on the spot, but you know, for years we've been talking about the need to really franchise our truly excellent programs so that wherever you live in the county, you can access it somewhere. And but I look at things like CAP 
visual arts at Einstein Global Ecology, one off, one place, huge county there at one school. What are the plans to finally, or do we finally have plans to actually franchise those programs so they are more available to more students? I think that's the, the goal of looking at the evaluation of programs. Mm -hmm. We have so many, and we really do need to see, and I think we're starting that process already, of what is what is in high demand based on what the students are telling us, looking at our, our participation numbers, um, academics, all of those things to really decide what we need to grow and where so we can have that access everywhere. So that's in process, and it will go along with the, the program work that we're doing this year. Thank you. And I just wanted to piggyback off of that notion. So Visual Arts Center is a really good example. So one of the things that we noticed, the Visual Arts Center is the longest standing program. That was something that I learned through the study as well. But one of the things is that we do is when we collect information about the applicants, who are the students applying from these programs, that information is given back to the school. It's given back to the Fine Arts Department, its central office, so that they can ensure that students have this great interest. Let's ensure that the programs at that local school are also just as robust. What are they looking for that they might not be getting? Because I think the idea, one of the biggest things that came out of that Metis report is that parents want viable, strong options in their local schools. And so although we'd like to create these regional programs purely or largely because of cost, um, because we can't replicate them everywhere, um, we start, this is in time demand. So when we're listening to what our families want we and we're at the, where the students are applying, we can get that information and give it back to the school, and that's real information that they can use to build their program. When we have large numbers of students applying to a humanities program, we can give that information back to the school, and that's why some of these academy and signature programs have been installed, because there's a large interest in research interdisciplinary-based programming, and schools are responding. So that happens every year, where if schools get that information, and then try to create very high interest, high engaging programming for their students at their school. And so sometimes it's really difficult to rival against very established programs because when they were by themselves, it looked like the hottest game in town. And now we have all of these different programs and it's gonna take some of these other programs a little while longer to kind of establish um, their footing as well. Sorry, one more question you made me think of when you were talking. Um, the the new program, the social justice uh, regional program at Whitman, um, has that is that starting as a regional program? This did it start this year or is that next year? The admission starts this fall, so it's going to be on the applicant, the high school common application this fall. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, it's, you know, it's so funny. I'm sitting here thinking and not even necessarily sure of the relevance, but you know, some of you have been working with on these issues back when I was a representative from MCCPTA on the <laughs> curriculum committee. So it's like 20 years or whatever. So I will say I'm very appreciative of all of the work, whether it's been for forever or um, newly established work um, that you all do on these issues that are really, really important. Um, it is nice to see us making some good progress and doing some of the things that we've been talking about for a long time um, to be seeing coming to fruition. So um, I very much look forward to getting our follow-up information about the demographic uh, data and, um, and the internship aspect. And um, I look forward to, I'm trying to think what we're talking about coming up, but you know, these are, these are conversations that we will continue to have uh, through special populations. Um, and um, just one thing that I would like to maybe add to an agenda coming up would be just a little bit more of a follow-up on the elementary school aspect of getting students who don't get it, you know, we, we still, I still hear concerns from parents about their kid did not get into a magnet program at the elementary or level and what we're doing to enrich their uh, students' educations. Um, you had mentioned, Ms. Hazel, about the 4-5 compact math and things like that. Um, whether or not we're still doing those type of things, how those are, programs are working, and um, and so just as an agenda item for the future, because um, over time we watch a lot of these things come and go and change and develop, and um, 
so it's good to stay on top of it. So thank you to all of our viewers, the millions of them that are out there. And uh, yes, absolutely. Um, this is an exciting committee, and I, I really appreciate the work that we do on it. So thank you all for being here. Have a great day. Bye. Oh, yes, we are adjourned. <laughs>